Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor at the Bulwark, and I'm joined by our regulars, Damon Linker of the Week and Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center. Bill Galston is off this week. Our special guest is New York Times columnist Brett Stevens. Um, so in, in anticipation of complaints that we may hear, I'm just going to acknowledge right up front that this week our panel does range only from center to center right and not from center left. So, uh, But we'll, we'll compensate for that in future episodes. Um, and I'm eager to dig right into the infrastructure bill and the other issues that we have on our plate. But before we turn to that, I'd like to just ask Linda, who has been our roving correspondent this week, to give us a, an update about her recent visit to the border. Well, I'm in Tucson, Arizona, and I decided I could not be that close to the border with Mexico without going down and seeing firsthand uh, what is going on. So I went uh, to Nogales, uh, crossed over into Mexico on foot, uh, spent an hour at the Kino Border Initiative, which is a nonprofit that's run by the Jesuits and some other Catholic charities. It's a uh, U.S. and Mexican effort. And essentially, they take in the people who show up at the border and are turned back, uh, who are apprehended and detained and then sent back. Uh, And they provide them with a shower, with hot meals. They provide the children with toys and playing material. Uh, I understand that pre-COVID, they could house about 100 people a day with sleeping facilities. They cannot do that now because of COVID. So I was there yesterday. There were um, upwards of over 100 people there. Uh, I had to uh, think about uh, our former president, Donald Trump's comments that the people who are coming to the United States will ruin America. I will tell you that there was not a person there that I would have not welcomed into my home, uh, been very comfortable sitting at the table with. They were mostly families, um, fathers and mothers with their young children. Uh, They were, um, you know, there were no gang members. There were no tattoos visible anywhere. These were people who were fleeing mostly Honduras uh, and Guatemala. Uh, They were very badly impacted by the uh, hurricanes last October. Many of these people were small business people. They had little businesses that had finally, the hurricane finally did them in. And uh, 90 percent, 95 percent of them have some ties in the United States. Uh, And so it was, you know, it was really wonderful to see them. The children looked good. The one very sad thing was that as I was leaving, there was a three-year-old child unconscious uh, and the ambulance had come and it was not clear to me and I wasn't going to intrude to try to find out whether she was suffering from heat stroke or whether she might have had COVID or some other disease, but she was uh, clearly unconscious uh, and was being given medical treatment. Uh, My only real adventure, Mona, was getting back into the United States where I had great difficulty. The border agent uh, was not buying my story that I was an American. (laughs) <laughs> uh, despite my U.S. passport, despite the fact my passport is in my married name, Gersten, he kept speaking Spanish to him. I tried to explain to, to him I don't to you, speak yeah. Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he continued to speak Spanish and finally looked at me and said, you really don't speak Spanish? And I said, I really don't speak Spanish. Um, and he questioned me for about 10 minutes. I don't know. I was there about 20 minutes altogether. He wanted me to produce my notebook. Uh, I said I was doing a story on immigration that I write about this frequently. I didn't have a notebook. I take my notes in my phone. He was surprised I didn't have a pen. I didn't have a purse. He couldn't believe I'd walked across and was walking back. He didn't know how I'd gotten there. He wanted to know where I bought my coffee from. Um, I didn't think I was going to go back in. But after questioning me for about 10 minutes and asking me every conceivable question under the sun, um, he finally said, well, have a nice rest of your day and let me in. 
Just unbelievable um, that an American citizen would be held up that way. You know, it does remind me of a story that a Washington Post reporter told many years ago. He was um, attempting to uh, enter Rwanda to do reporting about the uh, the war there and the and the terrible violence. And one of the border guards kept insisting that he he said, "You're a Tutsi." <laughs> and no, I'm an I'm an American reporter. I'm an American citizen. No, you're a Tootsie. The guy kept saying, and finally, uh, I think it was Keith Richburg. I think was his name. He said, "Yeah, you're right. I'm a Tootsie, and I'm trying to get into Rwanda. That's it. <laughs> yes, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh. I, uh, it uh, I I I have never crossed the border from Mexico into the United States seamlessly. I am always hmm. questioned. I hmm. do not know why. I think they suspect I'm part of some cartel. Maybe I'm too well dressed, um, and maybe I look affluent. I don't know what the story is. Um, but they- we we can't have affluent people coming across the border. I mean, really, <laughs> right. I, I don't know what the story is. All I know is I have an American passport that is filled with travel around the world, which also caused him to be a little suspicious, um, and. Um, the name on it is Gersten, but he expected I spoke Spanish. <sighs> well, Linda, welcome home. Thank uh, you. And, uh, and, and thanks for that. All right. Um, let us turn now to this huge infrastructure bill. Um, we are told that this will be in the neighborhood of $2 trillion more dollars um, and uh, will be followed by another huge, uh, up close to $2 trillion spending proposal. Um, in in a week or two, um, so uh, so Brett Stevens, I'm going to start with you. Um, it uh, it is billed as an infrastructure bill, and some of it is actually even about infrastructure. What do, what do you make of it? Well, it's size, Mona. Yeah, I mean that that's that's what really stands out above uh, anything else, and uh, more than its size, the fact that it is coming. Uh, literally a week or two on the heels of a $1.9 trillion stimulus package, which in turn comes on the heels of a $900 billion stimulus package. That one was in in December. Um, so altogether, it reminds me a little, leaving aside the particulars of what's inside uh, the bill, of that wonderful line, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the senator, of in the late 1960s, who said it, a billion here, a billion there, pretty soon you're talking about real money. Was it William Proxmire, maybe? It might have been. Yeah. But it's, it's sort of now kind of entered into political lore yep. um, beyond its the question of its, of its authorship. Um, but we're talking about real money, and we're talking about real money in a way that I think... Uh, might concern us. I mean, we, we've we've reached a point, it seems, where we think that there is no limit to um, how much the United States government can spend without consequences, no limit to uh, how, how we can drive interest rates to the ground and keep them there without regard uh, to inflation. But I think one thing to bear in mind is that no country on earth of which I'm aware has been able to defy the laws of economic gravity uh, indefinitely. So um, as much as uh, I'd love to see improved infrastructure, and I'm not surprised that Biden is pursuing an, an infrastructure bill of this, uh, of this magnitude, maybe we should also spend some time at least thinking about our fiscal infrastructure and just how Yeah. Um, Damon, the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, um, headed by our friend Maya McGinnis, who's been a guest on this program a number of times, um, put out a statement saying that um, they were, while they were concerned about the size of this, they said at least it is, there's an attempt to pay for it. Um, there, there is a proposal to raise taxes. Uh, some, some critics have said the taxes are not enough to cover um, the proposed spending, um, but there are tax increases included in this proposal. So are you cheered by that or not? 
Well, I, I think that that's certainly better than pretending we can just conjure a, another. It's actually, I think, $2.3 trillion out of thin air on top of the other $5 trillion that we've done that with over the last year. Um, so that, that eases my mind somewhat. And it is the case that with interest rates low, doing this kind of, well, I'll put in brackets this kind of, because I'm going to come back to this about exactly what is in this bill, which is far mm -hmm. beyond infrastructure. But to the extent that it is infrastructure, it, when interest rates are this low, it is the time that you would want to engage in this kind of uh, spending to address problems in our uh, in our public works that have been neglected and trying to build our industrial capacity for the future in ways that could really pay for themselves in the long run, especially with his interest rates low. Uh, so that's all good. And then if you pony up and say that at least a good chunk of it will be covered by taxes, uh, some of them, a good portion of them apparently will, would be, according to Biden, corporate taxes, and that makes itself a kind of sense given the, uh, the immense benefit that the business community uh, garners from having a robust infrastructure in place. Um, so all of this seems to make a good amount of sense to me. On the other hand, the bill is, is enormous, as Brett said. Um, and it is not just about infrastructure. If by infrastructure you define things like roads, bridges, trains, the electrical grid, these kinds of things, there's also a lot of other stuff in there. There's some pretty uh, ambitious initial initiatives on the, the climate change front, which Biden has has been advocating for, including in the campaign. And, and he's advocated for a lot more than is in here. So that implies there's going to be more down the pike. But then there's also $400 billion for care of the elderly, including higher wages for those who work in that sector. Uh, it, there's money for broadband internet, affordable housing, public school upgrades, community college expansion, R&D investments, supply chain upgrades, and what appears to be the rudiments of an industrial policy in the manufacturing sector, and much, much else. So. Um, th there's a reason why this is called uh, the American Jobs Plan and not the Great Infrastructure Bill, um, because it really isn't an infrastructure bill. It's an infrastructure bill plus a ton of other stuff. So I think uh, the, the the debate and conversation about this really needs to be about uh, is this what we want to be spending this amount of money on? Uh, and, you know, is it a wise choice of priorities? And, you know, thankfully, the White House released a very long document yesterday to go along with this proposal that sort of ticks through every element in it and makes at least a paragraph long justification of every line item. And the, the, the conversation needs to begin there, I think. And it's, it's going to be a serious one because this is not just uh, pocket change, <laughs> as Brett pointed yeah. out. It's it's Absolutely. it's a trillion here, a trillion yeah. there, and eventually you're talking real money. So there's You've definitely been a it. change since the '60s when it was mere yeah. billions, or millions in the '60s. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So so yeah, it's 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 sobering. You sent around for all of us before we recorded this, uh, Damon. A you know a handy little chart that shows. Um, how much they're spending on this and that, and you know, it's a series of numbers, and it says, you know, all numbers are in billions, which is, you know, even I mean, you you think we'd be used to that by now, but it's still kind of, kind of shocking. Right. Um, so then, then the end, the price tag at the end is uh, two thousand three hundred billion. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. It just, it just, it's just it's it's really amazing. Okay, so so um, Linda. Um, as I as I implied when with my question to Damon, look, uh, you know, it's I guess it's better to suggest paying for things than than you know just endlessly adding to our national debt through borrowing. But um, let me ask you to to talk about the the corporate 
taxes. I mean, we we had, I think, the highest corporate tax rate in the world before Trump and the Republicans reduced it in 2017. We're now somewhere in the middle of the pack uh, internationally in terms of corporate tax rates. Um, and and Biden proposes to to push it back up. You know, people could make the case, they could argue that that one of the reasons the economy was strong before COVID anyway, during the Trump years, was exactly because of the reduction in, in tax rates on corporations and that now that may be in, endangered by raising the rates. What, what do you think? Well, first of all, I think what you have to understand about business is business is about making money. And if you raise taxes on a business, they are going to figure out ways around paying that taxes. So what uh, Biden is proposing is to raise the rate back up to 28 percent from the 21 percent that uh, Trump lowered it to. That's not, you know, astronomical, certainly not bringing it back up to the 35. But as Democrats are very fond of pointing out, There are many companies that pay zero taxes at all, and that's because they have very, very clever lawyers and accountants, and they can allocate uh, their revenue in ways that means they don't end up paying taxes. So I'm not at all clear that raising the tax rate is going to do it. And I will say that the one thing that I thought was one of the smartest things I read this week was from that very far right-wing publication, The Washington Post. (laughs) Washington Post today, or yesterday, I think it was, said that Biden's plan shifts hundreds of billions of dollars from the private sector to the public sector on the theory that the latter can put them to better use. But they also said that, you know, in the past, what we've seen is that when you're trying to allocate investment capital, uh, whether you're picking winners amongst alternative industries, companies, technologies, and locations, the private sector usually does better than the public sector in picking those winners, that the market really does uh, tend to work uh, on these large scales. So that that's one of the big concerns. The other thing is, as both Damon and Brett pointed out, this is breathtaking in its scope. They're not just talking about, you know, repairing bridges that are about to collapse or doing something about our terrible roads or what we normally think of infrastructure. They also want to go in and make homes energy efficient. Now, um, I I lived in Boulder, Colorado, and uh, Boulder, which as you might imagine, was uh, very, you know, green. Uh, They passed uh, an ordinance that required landlords to make uh, their Uh, rental homes efficient. And it costs, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to do that if you if you owned rental properties. But we were able to hire people to do that job, you know, in the private sector, Uh, many of them probably immigrants uh, to do that job. Well, the Biden administration, which is all about bringing more people in and more immigrants and all of that, all of which, as you know, I favor, doesn't want those people doing those jobs. It wants these jobs to be done by union labor. They want prevailing wages paid, and they want private homeowners to hire union workers to do all of this work. That would make it simply out of the reach of ordinary Americans. I think this is a uh, a utopian uh, kind of plan that they put forth, one that ultimately will not work. And it's not at altogether clear. They, they would have to get it through on reconciliation. And since taxes are included in this, it's not at all clear they could do that. Um, I just, you know, I think it looked nice on paper. It sounded good with, you know, the policy wonks, but I don't give it a chance. Hmm. Well, you know, it's, I, I would <clears throat> jump in and say, yeah, it's not that it's utopian. It's French. Um, <laughs> and... <laughs> And it's worth it's worth considering that model. I mean, France is a country where um, the state sector of GDP, last I checked, uh, although these are pre-COVID figures, um, hovered around fifty percent, right, in the OEC tables. Um, and um, you know, France is a very nice country with great culture and a lot to recommend it, and and some very considerable strengths. But it's also a country that has been um, in economic decline 
for about 50 years, um, uh, since maybe since the middle 70s, uh, and certainly since uh, Mitterrand came to power in the early uh, 1980s. If you want to understand a little bit about France, notice um, how it is so often crippled by strikes. Notice how its uh, companies uh, are no longer uh, are no longer uh, world beaters. Notice how um, notice how uh, protests like the famous or notorious Gilets Jaunes um, uh, have become a dominant force in politics. And finally, notice how its politics is moving to in in directions that I I don't think anyone on this podcast likes, with some predictions that Marine Le Pen is going to come in first place in the at least the first round of voting of the next presidential election because years of economic stagnation have radicalized large parts of the French electorate. So, um, you know, I think a lot of voters on the left are thinking this is going to be the second coming of the 1950s in which somehow sky high taxes on the rich didn't matter. The middle class was in the driver's seat. We still had a huge industrial base that was uh, that was competitive and provided a robust standard of living for uh, the American middle class. And, you know, I don't want to claim that I, I have um, all the answers here, but the alternative to that scenario is what we now have in France and, and much of the rest of Europe, um, which is uh, sclerotic economies, um, self-serving, uh, self-serving elites, political polarization and, 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 and radicalization, um, and an absolute economic decline. And people ought to wrestle with that reality before they, they just sort of embrace Bidenomics as, um, as a kind of a return to a halcyon past. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, I would just add one more datum, um, and that is that France has had persistently high rates of youth unemployment um, in in some areas as high as fifty percent, and uh, which also contributes to social instability. Um, so, um, so yeah. But the, while we're on the so so last week on this podcast, George Will was offering with great optimism that, you know, perhaps uh, in their green energy plans, the Biden administration would look to a carbon tax instead of, you know, subsidizing this or that, or, or, you know, paying companies to invest in green technology and so on and so forth. Based on this plan, it doesn't look like we're headed in that direction at all. There is no, there's no carbon tax included. I'll go to you uh, on this, Damon. There's no carbon tax. And the other big thing that's missing that I would love to have seen, maybe this is my own hobby horse, but I don't think so. Um, you know, I think the, um, the, the, the gauge as to whether you're really serious about fighting climate change is, do you embrace nuclear power or don't you? And there's nothing in here about nuclear power. I mean, if, if we're going to be transforming our economy in a green direction, where is it? Yeah, well, these are Democrats. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I agree with you because I'm more of a centrist who sort of straddles uh, the Democratic Party and the more sane parts of the Republican Party. Mm-hmm. Um, so I agree with you that nuclear power needs to be a big part of things. I mean, obviously, the... The, the democratic response, the same democratic response to that is to say, well, yeah, sure, but it takes a long time to build nuclear power plants and to get them up and up online. And even, you know, and then this is, I guess, to, to, to blame progressives for the inability of progressives to do things like this. But I mean, think of the environmental regulations that need to be scaled in order to build even one nuclear power plant in 2021. I mean, I can't even begin to imagine. Um, so yeah, that's well, not they have a, become uniform, by the way. I mean, you know, there are these now new plants that are much smaller and and uh, they're all made exactly the same way so that, you know, you you license one, you license all. But anyway, I'm I'm in fantasy I, world I, now. I, I recognize I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm all in favor of it. I wish that <laughs> that, that uh, the Democrats would embrace this, but uh, you know, there are uh, 
the combination of kind of uh, street level fear that is sort of mostly ill informed among people that it's scary to have a nuclear power plant anywhere nearby because it's going to kill them with radiation, and then the the fact that uh, you know the environmental lobby doesn't want to go in that direction; they instead want more uh, state control to you know kind of wrench the. <laughs> the uh, American economy away from reliance on fossil fuels in favor of renewables, and they want that all done from the top down. I mean, it's the same reason why a carbon tax isn't in there. The carbon tax was is kind of a holdover from the same era of Obamacare, where I mean, a lot of Democrats now look back at Obamacare and just say, why did we compromise with the market at all? We should have just taken control of the healthcare sector and just made Medicare for all. Right. Well, similarly, they look at the environment and they're like, why would we compromise with the market and just try to jigger things by offering incentives and stuff like that when we can just boss boss the economy around and say, you can't do this and you got to do that. Um, and, you know, state planning, woohoo. Uh, we, you know, we things go sort of cyclically through history, and yeah. we've been through periods where that was popular, and then it became very unpopular. I mean, I filed a column this morning that will be running on Friday about whether we have finally definitively reached the end of the Reagan era. And uh, I think if Biden can get this plan through in anything like this form, now, uh, you know, uh, it, there there are all kinds of reasons to be skeptical of that. And Linda explained, uh, you know, the 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 challenges that they're going to face with getting it through Congress. Are they going to destroy? Uh, are they going to destroy the filibuster in order to ram it through the Senate? I don't know. But if they can get it through and then weather the 2022 midterms without a trouncing on the scale of 1994 or 2010, then I think we can definitively say that the Reagan era is over, that we are now in an era where Democrats are defining the terms of debate, that Republicans are going to have to kind of respond to that reality. And we're in an era where we're spending a trillion here, a trillion there, a trillion every couple of months on everything. And, um, you know, if, if a lot of our problems are partly a function of taking kind of zombie Reaganism, maybe a little too far too long, we're going to have a, a very different set of problems uh, uh, before you know it, I think. Right. Uh, let me let me just add a point to that, which is um, that, of course, you know, as we've said, the Republicans have forfeited their their uh, credibility on spending uh, because of their uh, huge deficits they ran under Trump. Um and uh, but it's also the case that even now in the in what is theoretically a post Trump Republican Party, um, the critique of this uh, bill from the Republicans so far has been simply that it plans to raise taxes, not that you know there are as as Brett was uh, explaining and and the rest of you you know that there are problems with this approach in general and that there are more efficient. Uh, ways to achieve good ends. Um, you know, yes, a certain amount of spending on infrastructure is is good idea, but uh, and even borrowing for that because it it is a long term investment in the economy. Um, but uh, but but the the advantage of a of a carbon tax, you know, it gets you to the same place, but it it doesn't do it by, by a top down command and control, and it's going to be much more economically efficient, and you actually get a lot more bang for your buck that way. But it, anyway, isn't it funny? Isn't it funny to think that that Ed Biden might get more res Republican support for this bill if he said, "Okay, we won't raise taxes; we'll just deficit right. spend another two point three trillion yeah, dollars," and then they'd right. be like, "Oh, great! Okay, that yeah, sounds good." Yeah. <laughs> well, and Anita Dunn, who is uh, one of his aides, has you know is going around telling Democrats on the Hill that this is popular with Republicans as well as Democratic voters. So yeah, that is a that's a fact. The uh, the the consensus um, between the two parties now is spend like crazy, but just you know there is a difference about whether you should pay tax pay for it with taxes or not. All right, let us uh, now turn to the Republicans who. Um, have issued an interesting, the Jim Banks, the uh, chairman of the uh, Republican Study Committee, put out a, a memo um, that uh, sort of outlines the Republican strategy for 
uh, transforming itself uh, into the Workers' Party. Um, and uh, Linda, I don't know about you, but I actually thought as as raw politics goes, uh, it was pretty smart. What did you think? Well, certainly um, it is a uh, more coherent and less overtly racist appeal than the than the Trump uh, agenda, but obviously it appeals on some of the same grounds, certainly on immigration and on trade. Uh, it is all about America first. Uh, the problem is, and I think it's it's difficult to sort of um, grapple with this, is is that I think there is going to be a price that Joe Biden is going to pay for um, the emphasis on race. And I do think that when uh, Jim Banks talked about wokeness and how this irritates most people, I think that is going to come to a head. And it's one of those kinds of issues where people are not necessarily going to talk about it out loud. Uh, they uh, may not object, you know, on all of the uh, transsexual uh, stuff that's going on. I mean, I heard Senator uh, Kennedy last night on, of all things, the Hannity show. My sister uh, is married to a Trumper, so we watch Fox News. But I have to say that Senator Kennedy did a very effective job of talking about uh, the sex versus gender and that most Americans understand that there are, in fact, two sexes and that while there may be uh, a certain percentage of people who have gender dysphoria, although it's probably much less than think they have gender dysphoria, that um, this idea of trying to rewrite human biology, uh, those kinds of issues hit people in a very visceral way. And I think if Biden continues to push on race, on transgender rights, on some of these um, issues that are really culture war issues, He's going to end up losing some of the voters who voted for him last time. So I don't think this um, this memo by Jim Banks is off the wall. I think it makes some smart uh, points, and uh, even on immigration, I think you know that um, there is support for immigration reform right now. But I will predict that. As the uh, numbers keep increasing at the border and the number of unaccompanied minors keep increasing, that we saw this derail immigration reform in uh, 2014, and I fear that that'll happen again. Yeah, and that's an important point because I think the the administration is losing, if it hasn't already lost, the opportunity for the kind of immigration reform that could be credible and sufficiently bipartisan to be lasting as well as um, transformative in a positive sense for uh, for the country and, and the economy. And look, I mean, what, what offends people about, many people about the immigration debate is the apparently cavalier attitude that so many people on the left and and also those of us who are you know basically pro immigration take toward the question of rule of law and that's a serious one and you know my my answer to that is the best way to address it is to change the law so that people can arrive here legally without the kind of um uh uh, torments that that you know we otherwise uh, put them through by by uh, an essentially uh, crazy system, but the but the Biden team has not helped itself. First of all, by denying that there is in fact serious humanitarian crisis uh, um, at the border by prioritizing uh, infrastructure uh, over uh, over immigration by I think doing nothing to woo sensible Republicans on this issue, people like Susan Collins and Mitt Romney and even Marco Rubio, who could be part of a, um, of a, uh, uh, of a broad immigration, uh, immigration overhaul. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's a large wasted opportunity and a gift to the side of the Republican Party. I really wish we wouldn't 
you know, I, I really wish, you know, we, sh we wouldn't or shouldn't be uh, cultivated. Um, so, uh, you know, th there, there's a moment here for Biden of creating a new center in American politics. And I really fear it's slipping through his fingers. David, one of the uh, one of the things in this memo, one of the points that is made by Banks is that uh, on the anti wokeness agenda, um, he says, you know that that he he draws a distinction uh, between the uh, black and Hispanic voters and the white uh, liberal Democrats, and there are some significant differences, and we can talk about that more in our next segment, but. Um, but he points out that that these people also find it um, find redefining biology offensive and are, are put off by it. And um, you know, it's a it's so I, I'd like to hear your views about you know Biden's bet, right? So he he's betting that he can give he can sort of hew very close to the left wing agenda on things like trans. Uh, rights and and uh, and and uh, racial matters and so forth, but that because he is delivering cash and jobs, so he hopes um, that uh, that that will weigh more heavily uh, with in voters' minds. Um, and the Republicans are betting that they can win with their um, with their cultural appeal. What's your sense of it? Well, um, I, I wrote about this a couple of weeks ago, and the headline of the piece was something like, will, will the Republicans' culture war gambit blow up in their faces? And that's, that's definitely a possibility, and it's something we just don't know yet. Um, I, I do think you're right in how you describe what Biden is trying to do. I think the Democratic gamble is effectively – they are saying to themselves, we we need to we need to hold these positions on transgender rights, on immigration, on all the woke stuff that's going on and churning through cultural institutions. Yes, the stuff they say to themselves, this is not popular. A lot of our voters, especially in the Midwest, uh, don't like this, especially non-college age voters. The few that still vote Democratic don't like it much, but uh, we, first of all, have to keep doing it because the most engaged voters in our coalition and the wealthiest voters in our coalition who donate money all take these positions and they will throw a fit and go nuts on social media and they'll withhold their money and they'll attack us if we don't keep up pushing on these left wing issues. And it, that's OK, because we're going to, as you described it, Mona, we're going to spend lavishly to make people's lives better in the areas of the country where they don't like these issues. And that combination will work for us. And as I said, will it work? I don't know. The Republicans very much. I mean, my response to reading that memo that we've been talking about was really I was not impressed. And so I guess here I'm sort of, uh, you know, taking Bill's position uh, on this more of the, the, the center left um, rather than pure center here, because there is like nothing in there. There's there's immigration, which is the Trump view on immigration, pretty much. Then there's kind of vague talk about being tough on trade, which is more Trumpy stuff. And then it's all culture war. And you compare that to the ambitiousness of what the Biden Democrats are trying to do on infrastructure, on the economy, on the, on, uh, the environment, uh, on, you know, um, child credits and money for children sent to people and, and money from the government that's almost like a, a nascent uh, universal basic income payment, just huge amounts of very expensive major things that are going to make concrete difference in people's lives. And you look at the Republican memo and it, it all sounds like a strategy for like social media and Fox News. Like what should we talk about and bash Democrats for for the next three and a half years in order to take back Congress? Congress. Will it work? Again, maybe it will, but we're in a very weird situation where you have the Democrats going crazy doing things and spending money and trying to concretely improve people's lives. 
And then the Republicans talking entirely about these kind of weirdly abstract cultural things about whether schools are teaching this or that about boys and girls. And I think all that stuff's important. And I'm on the more conservative side on all of those issues. Uh, but whether it can work as as a viable political strategy, I'm, I'm a little dubious about it. And it doesn't make me happy. I would much prefer a Biden who did a little less in what we were talking about earlier with all the spending, but in general, in that direction. Direction. I approve of a lot of it and then combined it with more of a culturally conservative position to say, you know what, uh, you know, boys and girls, we're not going to change the way we define that from the ground up because 0.3% of Americans are transgender and uh, we don't want to hurt feelings. That's a little too extreme of a reaction to a, a relatively small problem. Uh, and similarly with other woke issues. So um, yep. it, th- I don't know, th- I'll leave it at that. Yep. I could go yep. I would I would note that just linking the first two topics that we've discussed is um is the fact that in this uh plan that Biden has put forward he specifically wants to spend a fair amount of money on uh broadband for rural areas and you know also on improving manufacturing in the in the uh, industrial midwest now I have my doubts about whether the uh, manufacturing money will actually be well spent but um the uh, it is interesting that he seems to be again going directly for a constituency that's been very Trump friendly. Um, that's true, but also that's another example of a throwback to kind of an earlier era where we all thought broadband would make the world better. Like we really, <laughs> we really think making sure that people in the heartland have better connectivity to Twitter mm-hmm. and Facebook is going to be and good. to QAnon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Q- there you go. QAnon is going to come in loud and clear. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We that that could be when we form a new party. Our the first plank will be to eliminate social media entirely. All right. Um, um, so, um, we had, uh, this is another interesting column from you this week, Damon. We had, uh, information coming from, uh, Gallup about, um, about church membership, um, which has, uh, declined pretty steeply, uh, in America, uh, in the, uh, I think, as you put it in your column, from the 1930s through the 1990s, roughly 70% of Americans had membership in a church, synagogue, or mosque. And uh, today it is now down to 47%, which is uh, quite quite a drop. Um, what do you think this this means for uh, for the country? I, it's a very broad question, but there you go. Dan. Yeah, well, it's a it's a really big topic, and my what I wrote about this is a kind of sprawling column where I both try to talk about some some phenomena that we see in the country today in in light of it possibly having been caused by this decline of religion but then there's also the question of why the collapse in church membership is happening uh in the first place and it's it's hard to tease out some of the things i pointed out is um the rise of Trump can be partly explained by uh, the the perceived weakness of the religious right that a lot of people have thought like, wow, look, the religious right is so powerful because they have Trump on their side. But I think one reason why they were willing to embrace Trump was because he made a different pitch, whereas George W. Bush and his relationship with the religious right was a message of vote for me and will kind of transform the country in a generally uh, Christian friendly direction um, through policy and rhetoric and other things like this, whereas the, the Trump pitch to the religious right was effectively, you feel under siege in a secularizing country, vote for me, and as long as you pay your protection money by supporting me no matter what, then I will muscularly support you by pushing through your agenda, giving you judges, and so forth. And that sort of explains that relationship there in terms of the religious right feeling put upon and under threat and needing a kind of mob boss on its side. So that's part of it. And then a lot of the woke stuff. I think that people like Ross Douthat at the Times and a woman named uh, Tara Isabella Burton uh, wrote, she wrote a very good book 
uh, about a year ago titled Strange Rites, which is all about different forms of religiosity that are cropping up among young people who are spiritual but not religious. So they have spiritual longings, but they're completely untethered from any religious tradition or institution. And it's taking various bizarre forms from Harry Potter cosplaying groups where people dress up as Snape and Harry Potter and the other characters from those books to to uh, kind of strange BDSM sex groups and polyamory groups to including kind of social justice movements where a kind of post-Protestant mainline uh, uh, political left-wing agenda has taken over the ideological outlook of a lot of young people. And so you can see a lot of that kind of stuff on the left among young people and its enthusiasm there as as a function of people having a kind of craving for transcendence and justice and righteousness, but no concrete received tradition to give it shape and form. And so instead, it's sort of like we're living through a great awakening, but without churches. Um yeah, so that's that's part of it. I, I don't want to monopolize everything, but uh, you know, it's a complicated. Well, okay, the, but no, it's a it's a huge huge subject, as you say. Well, Linda, um, there, so so this data on um, membership is interesting. On the other hand, um, so that was from Gallup, but Pew in 2018 uh, looked at uh, what Americans believe, and uh, it found that 89 percent of Americans believe in God or a higher power. Uh, 56% believe in the God of uh, the uh, Bible. And here's something interesting. Even 72% of those who are religiously unaffiliated or call themselves nuns, that is, they have no religion, even 72% of nuns believe in God. Right. Yeah. No, we're not an atheist country. By the way, that the Gallup uh, survey had a very interesting tidbit in there that Damon didn't talk about, and that was the percentage of church membership among Hispanic Americans. It was the lowest of any group, 37%. And by the way, hmm. Blacks have one of the highest uh, membership in uh, churches. And, you know, I thought about that. Uh, there you're dealing with what is a very religious community, but not necessarily a church going community. And a lot of that stems from Latin America itself. I mean, Mexico, uh, the PRI, the, the uh, party that ruled Mexico and, and came out of the Mexican Revolution at the turn of the 20th century, um, was anti clerical, and the church was the big enemy. And churches, uh, you know, were uh, basically shut down. Priests became, they couldn't wear their clerical robes. Uh, they couldn't wear the Roman collar. And so you had a whole, you know, multiple generations of Mexican Catholics growing up without uh, a real affiliation to the Catholic church. But I don't think I've ever been into a Mexican household that didn't have an altar somewhere. You know, the Virgin of Guadalupe, uh, some candles, uh, pictures of, you know, deceased family members. So the idea of church membership and belief, I think, is the point you're making. That there is a disconnect there. Uh, it, I think what has happened is organized religion. And the affiliation and attachment to organized religion has declined dramatically in the United States. But I don't think, I mean, I think if you did a poll, I haven't seen the data on this, but I, I would bet a fair amount of money that if you did a poll in England or France or elsewhere in terms of religious belief, do you believe in God, they would come up much lower than we do. So I don't think we've become less religious in the sense of spiritual belief and belief in the Judeo-Christian God, um, but membership in churches and church attendance, which by the way, I think the COVID epidemic has probably uh, just really decimated the churches. Um, people weren't going to church. Uh, Catholics are required, an observant Catholic is required to go to mass every Sunday and on uh, religious uh, holy days in addition. Uh, that I think will have dropped off dramatically because of COVID. 
Uh, your reference to organized religion reminds me of the Will Rogers line that he said, I'm not a member of any organized political party. I'm a Democrat. Um, <laughs> right. But, um, but, but, uh, but I want to turn to Brett uh, because the, um, the decline in religious participation is linked, it seems to me, with the decline in marriage. Uh, because we know from a lot of different surveys that um, married people are far more likely to be church or synagogue or whatever members than single people. Um, and when people get divorced, they frequently um, they frequently stop going. And uh, if you look at uh, the share That's of adults... Because when you're married, you need God's assistance to get through life. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's probably right, especially sure. women. <laughs> I, should, I should underscore that that was said with a sense of humor. <laughs> so in, in 1970, the share of adults in America, 25 or older, who were married, uh, who were unmarried was, was 9%. And in 2018, it's 35%. So the, la- the, the decline in church membership might be, you know, these things are interconnected, of course. Um, you know, when you become less religious, you're also less likely to marry and remain married. But also if you're single, you're also less likely to join a church. So the two things sort of are are two halves of a of a circle there Mm -hmm. um and uh and so what we but what we find with fewer people in churches whether they still say they're religious or not is that we are losing social capital because churches are places where they're one of those mediating institutions in our society between the individual and the state uh, that performs tremendous numbers of social functions. Um, so uh, talk about that, if you would. Well, I mean, this is part of the kind of broad atomization of society that is also being accelerated by our uh, online worlds, although perhaps to some extent um, replaced by, you know, new forms of community uh, uh, formed online. But it's why I'm, I'm I'm so broadly pessimistic about where we stand socially uh, in in the United States. It just seems that more and more um, that the the bonds that hold us together, not just communally, but communally in a physical sense, um, are dissolving. And they have been, it is a process that for obvious reasons has been massively accelerated by COVID in a way that I don't think think we will ever fully reconstitute. I was reading just the other day in my own newspaper, a really interesting article about office life. Um, and that is to say, the other form of communal life we are not really going to uh, uh, go back to. Um, and it's going to lead to a kind of a, um, lives that are just fundamentally, I suspect, more isolated and more, uh, and more isolating what that does for mental health, what that, what, what that does for our political ideas, what that does for our uh, relationships, all has a kind of, um, you know, vaguely uh, brave new world um, uh, sort of ring to it uh, for me. So, you know, I mean, I hate to end this podcast on, on such a pessimistic note, you know, to quote, uh, someone I probably shouldn't quote, but I like him all the same, Woody Allen. It always is darkest before it goes absolutely black. <laughs> right. um, but it's, uh, it, it's a depressing trend. On the other hand, um, people form communities because they need them. And uh, maybe that is is something that is going to happen. I was in Los Angeles just last week eating outdoors um, with an old friend of mine whom I haven't seen in a while. And uh, right next to me for the first time in as long as I can remember, we spent most of the meal just striking up a conversation with uh, the couple that was sitting next to us. And clearly, I think part of that was that all four of us felt this desperate need to make conversation with people we didn't already know. Yeah, um, and, yeah. And that's kind of a good thing. Uh, and so maybe there will be something of a, like a bounce back as people just rediscover um, the, the, the joy, um, of, uh, 
and 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 the rewards of the company of of uh, strangers who who might yet be friends. Right. Um, yeah. I I've been wondering when I see all of these reports about how the workplace will be forever changed and and uh, people having learned that they can be so efficient working from home are going to con- want to continue that. And I'm wondering with you, Brett, whether there isn't going to be the opposite reactions. I cannot wait to get back to be among people again and uh, and how important that is for our mental health and, yeah, and our social life. Yeah, we're going to pet Sartre's proposition that hell is other people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that note, let us turn to our final segment where we highlight or lowlight something from the week. Linda, let's start with you. Well, I'm going to highlight something I haven't yet read, but I've read about, and um, that's because it's not yet available. It'll be available, I think, later this week. And that is the memoir published by Hunter Biden called Beautiful Things. The Washington Post has done a, a couple of pieces about it. They quote extensively from it. And I have to tell you, I, I would rarely order this kind of book. Um, I've ordered this book because I think the description of his descent into really hell, uh, I mean, this, I don't know what I imagined when I uh, understood during the campaign that he used cocaine and he used drugs, but it certainly was not what is described in this memoir. This was a man who was roaming the streets and was, you know, living on the street, who was cooking his own crack cocaine. Um, who was, you know, just basically um, a t- not just a drug addict, but his whole uh, his whole world came apart. And knowing the relationship with his father, and knowing Joe Biden's decision to run for president, which I think was very much affected by whether or not Hunter Biden could survive the kind of scrutiny that would come his way. Um, and the descriptions in, at one part in the book where uh, Biden is described as running after Hunter uh, in the driveway of the family home. There had been a family uh, intervention and Joe Biden runs and grabs Hunter, who's walked out because he's going to have none of this intervention and holding him and sobbing. Um, I just found it very effective. And I think um, I, I'm going to read the Hunter Biden memoir as much to understand Joe Biden as to understand Hunter Biden. I do think that, according to the Post, it glosses over the question of whether or not he should have been working for Burisma as a corporate director. It sounds like he really didn't give that uh you know, it's due. And I think he should have said it was probably a bad idea to accept that position, but apparently he does not say that. But anyway, that's my pick. I'm going to read it uh, with great interest. Interesting. Okay. Brett Stevens. Well, this is a less uplifting note, but um, a video has surfaced of a elderly Asian woman being pummeled on the streets of uh, New York by a complete uh, a complete stranger. And what's particularly horrifying about the video is that it's taken from the inside of a building where there are a pair of security guards uh, looking on. And the reaction of their of these security guards isn't to rush to the rescue of a defenseless elderly woman being viciously assaulted in broad daylight. It's uh, to close the door. There are a lot of myths about what happened with Kitty Genovese back in uh, 1964, but this was a real life Kitty Genovese moment. Um, And we should all uh, take a good close look at it and what it really means to be um, a bystander uh, to evil. So that was the, the, to me, the low moment of the week, but one we ought to pay uh, some attention to. Yeah. The, uh, Assaulter was arrested, so there at least is that piece he, of. He had killed news. his mother, by the way. He, yes, he was he out was, on parole after killing his parole. mother. That's correct. Um, all right, Damon Linker. 
Well, um, I mentioned Ross Douthat earlier, and I have plugged him uh, before, and uh, not to, you know, um, make Brett feel uncomfortable because this is a colleague, and I should be recommending him, but you know that would be weird because then it feels like we're <laughs> incestuous here. But um, Ross Douthat had a very good, uh, very good column this week, and I'm going to double recommend it because it's a column about something I also want to recommend. Uh, it was a column titled Babylon Berlin. Bab- Babylon America, question mark. Um, If people haven't heard of it, Babylon Berlin is uh, uh, an American-funded German television show uh, that has had, I think in in Germany, it's four seasons, but they've collapsed them into two long seasons here on Netflix. And it's really just fabulous. It's it's I think has the highest budget of any television show ever, and it it shows it. It's wonderfully written, uh, very well acted, very complex, and it's a fascinating television show about the Weimar Republic. Uh, the in the in the seasons that we have so far, they're they're leading up to in uh, 1929 up to the crash uh, that year. And the, the last season we've seen ends on the day of the crash. And it's just a fabulous portrait of that moment when all of us, you know, talk about uh, dramatic irony. Everyone knows from the very first frame of the first episode what's coming. But of course, nobody in the show knows what's coming. And that creates uh, tremendous tension through all of the storylines as they unfold in all of their intricateness. So it's it's very much recommended. And the column that Ross has written uses that show to reflect on the question of whether America is in its own Weimar moment, reflecting on Trump and January 6th and all the things related to it. And uh, it's very much worth reading, but read it and then go start watching the show. Um, excellent. I I have um, a two uh, quick things. One is I am um, reading um, The War That Ended Peace by Margaret Macmillan, which is a really fabulous uh, history of Europe uh, and the world, really, but mostly focusing on Europe uh, in the 19th century leading up and the early 20th leading up to World War I, what caused that long peace to be shattered that way. And it, it's just, I thought of it as we were discussing religion because there was a point in the late 19th and early 20th century where there was a lot of worry in Europe and the United States about the decline of religion and about the fact that people were turning to other forms of spirituality. Seances became all the rage, um, what was called spiritualism. Uh, and that was seen as a sign of decadence. And, uh, you know, so anyway, it's just a, it's, it's, but it's a very, very rich historical uh, book. Uh, wonderful. Um, but the other thing I wanted to mention, I do have something to celebrate or possibly celebrate, and that is I want to just recommend a piece by Derek Thompson in The Atlantic this week um, about, uh, what did he call it? Um, the, uh, the How MRNA Technology Could Change the World. And of course, mRNA technology is what was uh, responsible for the very rapid development of the vaccines against COVID. But this technology, this this medical breakthrough has potential for all kinds of other applications, including possibly a cure for malaria, which is the disease that kills more humans every year than, than uh, any other infectious disease. And um, possibly even for um, cancer, uh, so it's um, it's exciting and it's reason for for optimism. And so, um, since we talked about a lot of grim things, I thought I'd end on a note of hope. <laughs> and we want to uh, thank Brett very much for joining us. And uh, we will be back next week, as every week. 